We've barely arrived, and looking out over the Arafura swamp is already having an effect on Gordon. This landscape's very moving. It's the it's a hugely rich, and there's incredibly few people out there. This represents, in some ways, the end of a 13,000-year-old story, though not the end here, really. The process started with the rise of cultivation in the Near East, maybe in China and other centres, and the inexorable, slow erosion, uh, encroachment of hunter-gatherer lands by farming, farming populations that were ever-expanding. That began 13,000 years ago. And for most of the world, that process has now reached its, its culmination with the real extermination, really, of the old life way. Here, however, we've got an exception, and uh, very moving. For us in Britain today, water lilies are little more than a pond ornament but we believe they were once a staple food. Raminginning has a well-stocked supermarket, but the abundance of wild food here and the remoteness of the region make it easier for traditional skills to coexist with the modern world. Thank you. <laughs> Marley, I need you to show me which bit I should follow with my hands. Any leaf. So I took this leaf here, would that be good? It's important to wade in and join in. If you just look, you often miss important details in the gathering technique. <laughs> Much of the water lily can be eaten, but the most important bits are the large root bulb, or tuber, and also its fruit. <laughs> oh, there you have the fruit with its seeds inside. It's good. It's not bitter. That's good. Not at all bitter. Slightly like the seeds of cucumber. That's true. It has a cucumber flavour. Yeah. Mm, that's good. It's not hard to see why this plant might be important. It doesn't take long to gather a good haul, it's easy to cook, and it's available for much of the year. As well as being edible raw, water lily seeds can be processed to improve the taste preserve them and make them easier to digest. When it comes to cooking utensils, this is all that's needed. A leaf protects the cake from the ashes. So well, that looks very different. Ready now. It's very. It's very tasty. Mm. I think you wouldn't need to if you, if you ate a, a few a few cakes like that. They'd be quite full up, quite quickly. Mm. Yes. So it's a good sustaining food. Mm. We've always suspected that water lilies were, were, were perhaps an important food in Britain, not, not just because it's the only seed food that's turned up on archaeological sites, but also because we have the records from North America from very similar water lilies. For their having played a very significant role amongst people such as the Klamath, uh, for whom it provided the principal starch staple for three months or so of the year. But this has been now reinforced, this is this suspicion, by the local people here and their comments on the, on the role of water lily in their diet.
There are three generations tucking into this food. Tradition and modernity seem to sit side by side in their lives. You don't want to bump into one of these bushes in the dark because the edges of the leaves are covered in thorns. This is the pandanus, and it's got lots of uses. Later on, in a few weeks' time, we'll find fruits on this that contain an edible seed, and at the base of the fruit, there's a fibrous material you can suck a palm oil from. It's really delicious. And for Aboriginal people, this was a tremendously important tree. Today, the women have come out to collect the top fronds, which they're going to use produce fibres for the manufacture of dilly bags or carrying bags. Gathering bags are extremely important in all hunter-gatherer societies, but there's no trace of the ones our ancestors used. Everything has rotted away. <laughs> Nonetheless, I've used very similar processes to this myself, with plants in Britain like nettles and willow. And our ancestors simply must have had some form of similar basketry. This is the way skills are taught in this way of life, and these children clearly have a thirst for knowledge. Of course, as with everything these women do, we're talking so much more than subsistence living. They use roots and leaves to dye the pandanus. There's beauty and colour in everything here. And the same could well have been true of our own ancestors. They call this root yellow. No prizes for guessing why. After boiling for an hour or so, it comes out looking like this. Then it's dried overnight. It's been a fascinating day. Found all sorts of things here. This is a eucalyptus. I haven't been able to key down exactly which one yet, so I've got a bit of work to do. But uh, the local people use this to treat colds and headaches. And when you crush the leaf up, I know you can't smell it at home, but you probably know this smell, because this is very strong eucalyptus oil. It's exactly like you get out of the pharmacy at home. Lovely smell. And then there's this. This is the dry, dead trunk from a pandanus. To tell you about this, I need to set light to it first. These were used as slow matches for nomadic groups travelling through the outback, keeping their fire alight. You see it burns like a giant cigarette. And that's because it's basically just one big massive bundle of fibres. It's quite uh, astonishing to think that uh, people used to travel with their fire alight all the time, carrying it just like this. There are stories of people who'd lost their fire, the fire had gone out and it's a bit mysterious because most of the groups you work with here have the ability to make fire by rubbing sticks in one way or another. But anyway, within those stories they tell of having to send people, runners, to other communities, hundreds of kilometres sometimes away, to collect fire and bring it back and uh, this is the method they would have used. Sunset brings a spectacular sight. Fire stick farming in the nearby forest. It's the Aboriginal way of controlling the undergrowth. It also encourages new shoots, which in turn attract animals to graze, which are then hunted. It's effective and at night truly a strangely beautiful